Um, so uh, that's kind of pesky because then how do you know which one it's going to do if it has a choice? If you have a choice between being a nucleophile and a base, which one will you do? Well, generally speaking in organic chemistry, acid-base reactions tend to be fast. Acid-base reactions tend to be faster than other reactions. That means they happen before the other reactions have a chance to happen. So generally speaking, if there's an opportunity for the Grignard to act like a base and deprotonate somebody, that's what it's going to do. So if the Grignard has a choice, if the Grignard has a choice between deprotonating somebody and acting like a nucleophile, it's going to deprotonate. That's actually going to turn out to be important, so we'll have to work through that carefully. Okay. If the Grignard has a choice, it would just uh, deprotonate somebody. All right. Um, Who can you deprotonate? The things that are easy to deprotonate are basic, basically electronegative atoms. So a Grignard would like to deprotonate an electronegative atom, especially say an oxygen is the most common. Grignards like to deprotonate electronegative atoms, especially say oxygens. That's what, we, that's what happened here. The Grignard deprotonated this oxygen. Can't Grignards only attack carbonyls? Ah, that's a good question. Well, and now we've seen that that's, uh, we've seen that it turns out that's not right. Yeah. So, um, Grignards can attack carbonyls, and they can also deprotonate electronegative atoms. And that turns out to be important. Yeah, yeah and you actually need to know about both of those. Um, as we go along, you'll see that, you'll see, um, you might not recognize it, but you'll see that what we're talking about here has, has been covered in your course. You just might not have realized uh, it. It's not that they can't do it, that they can't. You want to they avoid them doing alcohols, it. That's what it was. Pardon? They can't react with alcohols, right? Ah, uh, well, let's think about that. Here we have an alcohol. Does this alcohol have anything that could be deprotonated? Oh. Yeah. Remember, what do Grignards like to deprotonate? They like to deprotonate electronegative atoms, especially alcohol, uh, especially oxygens. So this could get deprotonated as well. So I think what you're thinking about is um, what what you wanted to say is generally speaking, we we don't want Grignards to act like bases. We generally want them to act like nucleophiles. So what we generally do is we generally don't put them in the same flask with water or alcohols. I think that's what you were thinking. Generally, you don't want them to react with alcohols. So generally, you try to keep alcohols away from Grignards. You try to keep alcohols away from Grignards because you don't want them to act like a base. Because you can see what happened here. What happened to this Grignard when it deprotonated this water is it was destroyed. It's not a Grignard anymore. Oh. So what you really want to say is um, alcohols and water destroy Grignards. So it's not that they don't react with them, they react with them too much. They react, they react with them in ways that are usually not useful to us. Grignards react with alcohol and water in ways that are not useful to us. Um, <clears throat> so maybe uh, it would have been better to say before, we don't want to say that Grignards only react with carbonyls, but the main useful way they so react like, is I with carbonyls. I think that's because he said that when we were doing mechanisms, some, like the SLCU guy, so I think he just meant that you can't use them when you're trying to make stuff like that. That's right. Okay. okay. And again, all these ideas will clarify as we go along. These are very important ideas, so we'll, make, we'll try to make sure we've got this down. Okay, so, where are we? Um, let's try to draw the mechanism and the products from this reaction. Take your time and try to draw the mechanism and the products here.
Okay. There's a couple of hiccups there, but it looks like you guys got the main ideas. First of all, we have to turn this into an ionic bond. So we erase the covalent bond first, and we put in the charges, and then we can immediately put the negative charge at the tail. So then the question is, who goes at the head? Well, let's draw this molecule out a little bit more. All right, so we can draw this out more. I think one of you might have forgotten to put the charge in here. Remember, we have to always draw all the charges. The charge is the most important part. Now, who's going to be at the head of the arrow here? It looks like you both correctly figured out that the hydrogen would be at the head. Um, now, actually, a lot of people might get that wrong because after all, it's the oxygen that has the positive charge, right? So this could be confusing to some people. Um, so let me give you two ways to think about this. The first thing is we know that we expect the Grignard to act like a base here. Well, a base steals a proton. A base steals a proton. Um, if the Grignard was going to act, uh, if the Grignard was attacking the oxygen, it would be acting like a nucleophile, right? Um, and then the oxygen would be acting like an electrophile. But so far, we've only seen carbon electrophiles. So far, we've only seen carbon electrophiles, so that would be a reason we wouldn't want to expect this to act like an electrophile. The most important thing, though, is even though you have to draw the positive charge on the oxygen, you have to remember that it's really spread over the entire molecule. When you see a formal charge, you have to draw it on the technically correct atom, but then you should actually picture it as being spread over the entire <coughs> molecule. If we just had pure water, If we just had neutral water, we would know that the hydrogen would have more positive charge than the oxygen. Well, then when we put this new positive charge in and spread it over the whole molecule, the hydrogen still has maybe even more positive charge than the oxygen, even though technically the formal charge is on the oxygen over here. This is actually pretty pesky and unfortunate, because uh, I've been telling you how important it is to use the charges to tell where to put in the arrows, but the charges are a little bit hard to interpret over here. So a charge does not necessarily mean that's where the arrow is going, because the charge is spread over the whole molecule. So it takes practice to diagnose that. That didn't give you any trouble here, but that's something to watch out for. OK, and then we would uh, kick this off uh, over here. All right, and as usual, we'd like to number. One, two, three. So I'll start with the number one carbon. Who's the number one carbon attached to? Two. Two. And who's the two attached to? Three. And who else? The new hydrogen. I'll go ahead and draw that new hydrogen in. So here's the new hydrogen. You don't have to draw this in, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we have the OH2. Now let's go back and change two charges at the initial tail and the final head. Well, this started negative, so it ended up neutral. And this started positive, so it ended up neutral. Since it started positive and it gaining electron, it ended up neutral. And then we also have this spectator on it, the magnesium bromide. Now the magnesium bromide is still positive. The magnesium bromide always stays positive because there's no changes happening to it. Um, but in this case, I don't think there's anybody for it to bond to anymore, right? There's nobody for this to form an ionic bond with, so now you just have to write this as a separate ion. In this case, you would just write the magnesium bromide as a separate ion. Uh, there's nobody for it to form an ionic bond with. But you can't take off the charge on the magnesium bromide. Uh, that's never going to change. All right, I, I think, uh, except so, you guys might have had a little trouble with the charges here, but otherwise you were getting the right picture. Um, so that's good. So far, so good. Okay. All right, so uh, we've seen one thing that we can do with grid yards, um, and now we just need to learn about the other thing that we should do with grid yards. Now again, this is something that you usually want to avoid doing with grid yards because it destroys the grid yard. So this is a reaction that's more, uh, uh, more of a danger than something you want. Now I don't want to be too absolute about that. For example, well, what's the name of this molecule here? This is propane, right? Well, if you really had a hankering for propane, this would be a good way to make it, all right? Sometimes you really do want to make just a simple alkane, and then a grid yard might be a good way to do that. But usually, you want to avoid um, protonating this. So what that basically means is you need to avoid using protic solvents in the, in the uh, vicinity of the grid yard. Avoid using protic solvents? That's right, unless you want to protonate the grid yard. What do protic solvents do? They tend to protonate grid yards. Basically, again, in general, you want to avoid using anybody with a hydrogen on an electronegative atom, especially protic solvents with OH or NH bonds, as we've seen before. OK, um, because that would destroy the grid yard and keep it from doing something more interesting. OK.